-hmm. All right, good. I just want to also start before we get going officially and talk a little bit about uh, commemorating Juneteenth Day, which is today, uh, June 19th. And uh, for those of you, I just listened to some stories about it, and it's, it's actually not the Emancipation Act, but it's the time that uh, the slaves in Texas heard about emancipation and the order was it was it was uh, two years after the actual Emancipation Act came to be in, in a, a while after the Civil War was over that the slaves were freed in Texas so this became a celebration and it's now a national holiday in several states maybe it will be in all the states before long so uh, I just want to commemorate that today's a very special day with celebrations all across the country and the African-American community, and I'm sure many of uh, many of you will be joining in on those celebrations uh, as well. So I just want to commemorate that day. And uh, I'm going to, uh, Elk, are you on now? I am on. I, I have a video going, but uh, obviously um, my picture is not there. All right. Well, Elk, I'll let you kick this off just, just in terms of uh, talking about it, because you and I have been talking about this for several months, probably six months, and maybe you can introduce yourself uh, and talk about the uh, the event today. Sure, yeah, so good morning and apologies for uh, joining later. Apparently I was in the wrong meeting. Um, so I'm Ed Kalipka, I'm the CEO of uh, TSRL. We're a preclinical accelerator here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, my background is in pharmaceutics. I have a pharmacy degree and a PhD in pharmacology from um, the University of Frankfurt in Germany. And I had the opportunity to come and work at the University of Michigan during my graduate studies and, and um, that fell in love with Anaba and ended up never leaving. <laughs> so I had a number of um, transitions since I came here in 1992. So initially as a student, and uh, then I worked actually for TSRL for a few years before I moved over to Park Davis, um, which then of course became Pfizer and um, uh, worked for Experian for, for a number of years. And when the site closed, um, came in a business development function back to TSRL. I've been always extremely interested in translational sciences and, and the interface of science and business and uh, had in my uh, roles at Park Davis, Pfizer was involved with um, strategic alliances, so was on the receiving side of technologies from universities and um, have often seen that that was struggle in the translation in, in that piece from, from preclinical to clinical testing that what we call in, in our field the uh, valley of death and um, it's a particular interesting area because oftentimes it's very driven by by the financial considerations there and if you can raise enough funding to move a project forward but there's um, there are a lot of good ideas that that can can really be moved to to the next stage uh, where we have a better assessment of can this be a drug product before we uh, make a larger amounts of investment for, for full development and forming company and you know and bringing uh, a lot of pieces to the table. So what we do and what we have sort of a niche market is um, we work closely with, uh, with the NIH and, and the funding mechanisms that they provide and we have a team of 10 people that are mostly um, X Pfizer drug development folks and so we'll, we'll bring a full drug development team and an initial funding that can range anywhere from from uh, five to ten million in grant funding to a given project and and we're not picking it up to say we think this can be a product opportunity our pitch is really will we'll help with the with the mechanism of, of the NIH funding to do additional research to de-risk the project and really understand is there a product opportunity and and the milestone here is always that um, we want to see efficacy in an in a animal model and we also want to have some measure of safety so we know is there a safe window for, for, this, um, uh, for this product opportunity. There, there are many challenges in, in drug development and, and from a regulatory perspective. Many drugs fail very early on and never make it to the clinic. Um, and there's also many regulatory challenges and, and then you know, personal challenges and leadership challenges and so we've been in that space now um, for 13 years really um, and started out as a company 
been founded by a university professor and then in, in recent years we uh, turned the business model around to this accelerator model and now work with organizations across the US. We have five funded projects. Um, one is moving towards uh, IND and uh, work in the infectious disease space exclusively. So that has been, of course, in the last uh, couple of weeks, a pretty wild ride with COVID coming to uh, the play. And um, we think it's a great opportunity if actually for infectious disease um, therapeutics and, and vaccines to have a broader impact and, and really, as we see right now, get people to work across boundaries and across uh, perceived competitive challenges to um, to move these products forward. And, all right, well, we'll let you uh, see if you get your camera going. We're going to hear more about uh, Elka's story of, of turning this company around, really, and transforming it from one type of uh, organization to, to a completely different model and, uh, and where that's going. But I want to turn to Kelly. Um, we really have three leaders today who are relatively uh, new to their positions. Elka has been there for 13 years, but it's, she's been CEO uh, for the last several, uh, maybe four or five. Is that right, Elka? Something like that? Uh, yes, uh, five. Mm -hmm. Five years, yeah. Uh, taking over at the untimely death of uh, the, her former CEO. Uh, but we're going to turn to uh, to Kelly now. Kelly, you've been in your chair, what, a couple years at this point? Yeah, about two and a half years now. Great. Well, do you want to talk about what's happening at Tech Transfer and some of the visions you have, what you're trying to do, and, and how that's going so far, and also maybe how the COVID has uh, has impacted your situation? Sure. Happy to. So, um, yeah, I was, uh, prior to coming to um, University of Michigan, I first uh, became interested, like Elko was describing, in this intersection between research and business. And for me in particular, um, biotech and business, when I was a, a postdoc at Stanford and um, the lab I was in, um, like many labs at Stanford had a lot of connections with biotech companies. We were filing patents and I became really interested in what's this group of people with scientific backgrounds that are filing these patents for us and helping us talk with these biotech companies? What, what are they doing? And um, became really just fascinated with it and um, at the end of my postdoc um, started working in the Stanford Office of Technology Licensing and I, I really didn't know how lucky I was. Um, turns out it's you know one of the best in the in the country um, uh, and in the world as well. And so spent almost a year there and had just great sponsorship and mentorship um, through that experience and then moved to North Carolina State University in the Research Triangle area um, I, had, I had told my husband we were going to start a family and we um, needed higher salaries and there was this great place called RTP and we'd both get jobs and it would be fabulous. And that's exactly what we did and spent 12 great years at NC State, uh, the last five uh, leading um, their tech transfer and startup efforts. And some of the things I really loved about that position, in addition to being at the intersection of science and business, was also finding better ways to connect the university uh, with the startup ecosystem. And in particular, also thinking broadly about that and trying to better connect with the alumni base of the institution. So one of the funner projects I, I worked on there was helping to create an alumni angel investor network for the university that was built on a model that was piloted at Duke University. Um, we stood ours up collaboratively with UNC Chapel Hill it was the only time I saw these three universities really collaborate well in, in any area, um, given our, our numerous rivalries. Um, but that showed me there's, there's really something to be gained when universities work well together. And you know, I've, I've enjoyed my, my work with my colleagues at the MEDC and at the URC that are working to help stitch our, our big universities in Michigan together and help um, develop new programs for us to collaborate. So I was um, kind of happily um, minding my own business in, in Raleigh. My husband and I had just bought a new house. We had a, a year and a half year old, um, our third son. We needed a third, we needed a fourth bedroom. And I was unpacking and I got a call from the University of Michigan. And I, I must uh, uh. have been, been feeling adventurous. So I decided to come up and um, just fell in love with um, Ann Arbor and the university. 
um, enough to move in the middle of winter 2018, 2019. Wow. Um, so it was, or 2017, excuse me, 2018. So I started January. Um, it, it, you know, didn't get to see Ann Arbor actually for the next six months until the snow melted, but it was it was a great um, great experience. Um, you know, one of the things for me coming in, I was um, inheriting, um, and one of the reasons I wanted to come was it was a great office with an amazing team. Um, it had really pioneered a model around integrating the tech transfer function with startup activity, which was one of my areas of passion and one of the things I really loved about the model. Um, you know, my predecessor, Ken Nisbet, who probably many of you know, had been in the position for about 17 years. So, you know, coming in as this new person from a new ecosystem with a really amazing and experienced team, um, you know, we, I wanted to, one of, one of my first concerns was how am I going to um, be able to make um, my imprint and, you know, convince the team that, you know, there are some things that some new areas we want to address and um, some changes we want to make. Um, I um, had something really fortunate happen that, that really helped me as a new leader in the office. And at the time, it seemed like a disaster, but, but in hindsight, I realized it was a gift. Um, as I was coming in, um, the week before I arrived, the um, office had transitioned um, from what you might call one database to another. But what that really means is we took everything that manages one of the nation's largest academic patent portfolios, licensed database, CRMs. We took all the data and we moved it to a new system. And that happened the week before I arrived. Um, so my first three months in the office, we were unable to invoice any of our licensees, um, distribute licensing revenue to any of our inventors, or pay any of our invoices to patent attorneys. So it was, um, if you're, you know, if you study leadership and change management, establish a sense of urgency is one of the <laughs> first things <laughs> you should do coming in. And I didn't have to do that at all. It had been done for me. Um, so we were really able to work as a team through some really um, sticky issues. Um, you can imagine some of the faculty who were expecting licensing royalty checks were some of our most prolific and important inventors. So I got to have really great conversations with them early on <laughs> to explain what was happening. Um, and, and so from there, we worked through a lot of really tough critical problems um, and came out of it really strong and decided to spend the first summer that I was in the office uh, working on our vision for where we wanted to go as a team. I knew coming in, I had one of the, the best teams um, in any university tech transfer office and that the way we were going to move forward wasn't just going to be my vision for them. I needed their input um, and I, I wanted to hear their voice. So, um, you know, we did we did a lot of work around this. Um, one of my my favorite efforts was a day we spent um, envisioning what do we want the headline to look like 20 years from now about University of Michigan tech transfer. We broke into groups and when we came back there were just so many common threads throughout all the stories. Um, one of them was we wanted um, University of Michigan inventors um, to have won more Nobel Prizes and we wanted to have played a role in that by helping to increase the impact of their research by bringing it out into the world. Um, as a sidebar, about two months later, um, we did indeed um, have another uh, University of Michigan innovator uh, win the um, Nobel Prize for, for his work in um, laser technology um, that had been commercialized as the intralace LASIK eye procedure. Um, but there were other big things. Um, we wanted to be able to abolish tuition for in-state students because we generated so much licensing revenue that we were able to fully support the university. So we had really big goals and some of the common threads were we wanted to do big things for the university, for our region and for the state, uh, but we also wanted to have global impact. So, you know, kind of with this, this vision as the basis, we came up with our, our beliefs that we're gonna define our culture and we're gonna help us prioritize the things we worked on and the things we passed on. Um, we came up with our vision for the office that we struggled a lot with because we wanted to capture that, that local impact as well as global reach of the, the university. 
So um, the way that um, finally coalesced after we um, argued, debated, um, got some really good ideas, threw them all out the window and started over was to say that we're inspired to demonstrate how world-class university research can fuel a region and solve the world's biggest challenges. And, you know, Rob, you asked me to speak a bit about the time of COVID-19. Um, you know, that vision really carried us through to this um, because uh, we knew that the work that we were gonna do, we said in, you know, mid-March, the invention disclosures we're gonna see in the next few weeks from University of Michigan faculty are going to have direct positive impacts on this pandemic. And we've really seen that happen. Um, we went from having virtually no COVID-19 research at the university um, to at last count having nearly 200 different projects ranging from therapeutics to medical device to having a better public health understanding um, of the, the impacts of COVID-19 to understanding what impacts it's gonna have on society. Um, so, you know, for us, I feel, you know, really, and I think it carries through to the team, I feel really honored to be able to sit and watch as one of the largest research enterprises um, at any university in our country pivots to go after this current pandemic and increase our understanding of the disease and, and to help us be able to combat it. So um, for me, if anything, this only highlights the importance of public investments in research universities um, like U of M, um, of our ability to be flexible in our research and to take it in new and interesting directions to address um, societal challenges as they arise, so. Thank you, Kelly. Can, can you say uh, in terms of if somebody, uh, business people want to connect with uh, your office, what, what would be the best way to do that? Yeah. Maybe so put that on the chat. And, uh, yeah, yeah, send me an email. I'll put it on there. My colleague, Diane Buis is also here as well. Um, Diane is a super connector and within the community. She also runs our venture accelerator um, within the office. And, and a bit of good news, on some days working at the nation's largest public research university is the funnest thing in the world. On other days when you have executive orders and have to ramp down research across the nation's largest public research university, it can be a real drag. Um, so we, we um, through our office, help support um, the Office of Research and our faculty as they largely left their laboratories, um, beginning with the governor's executive order. For us, we love research that was painful um, to watch. Exceptions were made for critical work um, that could directly address the current pandemic, but it also applied to the startup companies and our venture accelerator. And um, we're happy to report um, that research is ramping up across the University of Michigan. It's like watching the sunrise. It's, it's, it's wonderful to see people back in the labs. And the same is true for our venture accelerator. Our startup companies were able to get back into the labs yesterday. So we Fantastic. were really thrilled about that. Yeah. Well, let's all give Kelly a big hand for all that she's done at the uh, university so far in a short, short span. And I love your, uh, your idea about the uh, headline in 20 years. I, may, I, may I use that <laughs> in my, my consulting? That's, that's great. Uh, and, and also, I think you're, you're, the notion, I call it the big, hairy, audacious goal, but, you know, like uh, creating so much revenues that uh, you don't have to pay tuition. I mean, these are wonderful visions to have and really inspire people. Uh, Diane, you were mentioned out there. You want to pop your head in there and say hi to everybody and say what you do? Good morning, and thank you for the shout out, Kelly. Um, well, that's a great background. Where are you? And you sound like you got into a Van Gogh painting. Is that... I, you know, um, this is this is actually a local Michigan artist. Her name is Diana Fleischer, and I just really like her art, and so I use uh, I use it as a background. I, I you know, especially in the, on gray days, a couple of months ago, it would lift me up a little. And That's and great. every now and then, we can all use a lift. Well, and Diane, it has the additional advantage of craziness goes on behind me. You wouldn't be able to see it. Now there is no craziness. I'm just sitting on my chair. But you know. Diane, I, have to, yes. I have to say that you are the person I call on when I need some light in my day and light, lift it up. You're that kind of person. so <laughs> I appreciate and happy to oblige. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, I, I really enjoy seeing all the great faces on the call today. 
um, it is it is really exciting to talk about what you know what what excites me the most, and that is really bringing great science forward. So that's something that that Kelly spoke to far more eloquently than I do. But I have the pleasure of running the venture accelerator at the Office of Tech Transfer. And that is a role that I usually call uh, landlord and mother hen to 20 startups. And so we are seeing seven of these startups coming back to the lab um, as of yesterday and today. And that's super exciting. And uh, so that's the landlording part. The mother henning part is really making connections. And that's why I have benefited enormously from, from um, being part of this group and showing up and always learning from others. There's so many great people here. Thanks. Yeah, you got time for one question. It's a question from Roger asking, what are some of the adjustments uh, that, that you've had to make? Yeah, yeah. So the, the research labs, um, you know, consistent with the executive order, um, things like um, single point of entry for buildings, um, having greeters on hand um, that will ask screening questions. Um, you know, have you, do you have a fever? Have you had any of these symptoms? Um, temperature scans as people enter the building. Um, the universities, um, you know, been supplying PPE. I'll make a side note here that, um, you know, PPE was something I, I knew nothing about um, in early March and it soon became a, a you know, a, a side job for our office in the early days as the, the wave was kind of crashing down on the, the university hospital to help Michigan Medicine find new and emerging sources of PPE. Um, there were a lot of, um, there were a lot of offers, not all of them legitimate. Um, and we were really working to, to also find, um, you know, companies that could adapt their production line and start making PPE. So that was also a really fulfilling piece of our work. And like many of the great things that we do, um, that idea to take our resources and focus it there came not from me, but, but from the great folks on the team. So, I mean, yeah, um, research is restarting at the University of Michigan, but labs, in, uh, as they begin their, um, their research, are limited to um, uh, taking what, what you could accomplish in a socially distanced measure. Um, so that's, I think, Diane, is at 140 square feet per person and maintaining six feet of distance at all time. Um, take that and go down to 30% of that. And that's what you're allowed to have in the research laboratory for the first two weeks as you start to ramp up. Because um, for us, we've learned that the research ramp up um, is really a, t a kind of a test run for fall. We have to absolutely get this right as we ramp research back up. Uh, we want to have minimal to no um, COVID-19 cases uh, resulting and, and no spread. And so we're approaching it, um, as researchers do, as an experiment. How long the experiment lasts depends on the results that we get. And if um, you know, we have problems with this experiment, we may have to shut it down and go back down to minimal research again. And no one wants to see that happen. So every image I've seen of our faculty and researchers getting back into the labs has been one of gratitude. Um, people are wearing the PPE and are socially distancing. So we're, so far, for something as big as it is, it's going really well. I had one of the benefits of, uh, of you guys shutting down is I made some new friends. I, I, Alfredo uh, Guerra is on there and Alfredo's a, I met him as a friend because we play at the same playground. He plays with his kids, I play with my grandkids. So Alfredo, welcome to the uh, board. He's doing some little microbiology and uh, so that, I'm sure he's contributing. Um, we're gonna switch over to, uh, thank you very much again. And could you just say, by the way, I, I remember a few years ago, U of M passed $1 billion in research money. W where are you at at this point? 1.6 um, as of the last um, last fiscal year, and so that places us at number the number one public research university by um, research expenditures in the country, and it places us just two in the nation behind um, Johns Hopkins. Wow, that's um, great. Yeah, so we'll we'll all see what the future holds in this new and interesting time. But yeah, they always say it's hard to make that first billion, but. But after that, it's simple, right? <laughs> Only 200 years to the first billion and, you know, five years later, you're at 1.6. So who knows how fast it'll go. Uh, we're going to switch over to Stephanie, who's still working on her first billion. Am I, am I correct, Stephanie? Or are you already there? Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. 
not there yet. Well, no. listen, will you, when, when you get there, will you call us all up to a big cele celebration? Hopefully we could do it in person, but uh, you know, if you get there yeah. before the COVID over, let, let us know. I will, so, I'll, I'll definitely call everybody. Um, right, just, so I wouldn't be sitting your by your phone. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, I will hold it on, on ready. Uh, could you give us a little story about what you've done and you're in a little different world. It's, it's uh, research, but it's with animals. So, uh, yeah, yeah, we're, um, we're a unique story in Ann Arbor, um, because we are making products for, uh, pets, um, actually for all animals, but we're focused on pets. So, um, like I said earlier in my background, I'm a, I'm a veterinarian by trade. Um, and when I came to Ann Arbor and I was at, the University of Michigan Medical School, um, I was privy to many of these phenomenal um, research projects and commercialization opportunities that, that Kelly has spoken about. And, um, you know, I loved the atmosphere of Ann Arbor where you could sit. I did a lot of meetings and coffee shops um, because when I was, I, there's a lot of familiar faces and names on here. Um, when I was looking to move to the east side, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I ended up meeting over 100 people in the state of Michigan and trying to figure out what I want to do with the rest of my life. And um, actually, I see Scott Trosen is on here. Um, Scott was one of my connections when he was at Ann Arbor Spark. And he, he said this word elevator pitch to me, which I had never really heard before. And he said, you need your elevator pitch. What is it you want? And so very similar to what Kelly has said and, and Elka has said is that I liked translating science to business and business to science because there's not everybody's able to do that. Um, my background's in clinical sciences. Um, you know, I was in my undergrad is actually uh, in hotel restaurant management or hospitality business. So um, there's nothing uh, strategic about my career. Um, it has been a very gut driven uh, opportunity uh, seeking kind of, and actually not even seeking, um, just opportunity uh, knocking kind of career. And I've allowed myself to kind of pivot when it felt right. And some of that was, you know, uh, life related and some of it was just opportunity. But um, I came here, I met with all of these people <clears throat> and ultimately that's how I ended up at University of Michigan Medical School um, and because Connie Chang was one of the people that I was introduced to and I just thought she was fantastic and someone I would love to work for and so um, so being a twice over Spartan grad it was a little tough to work at University of Michigan but I did it um, and I loved it I mean I just the team at FFMI was amazing I had never I learned say about. FM, can you say what that is? FM. Oh, fast forward medical innovation. Yeah, um, you know, I, I I learned that's where I learned about tech transfer. I learned about sponsored research. Um, I learned about commercialization pathways, the valley of death, all these things that that everyone's talking about. Um, I was in preclinical research before that as a veterinarian and then as an operations manager for. MPI research, which is now um, was a, recently acquired by um, Charles River. And so I was caring for animals and, and conducting, uh, managing the people who were conducting the research for um, human pharmaceutical medical device and some um, FDA, Center for Veterinary Medicine um, approved drugs as well. So, uh, you know, I transitioned from that to the very beginning of that pipeline and learned a ton. And what ended up happening for me was um, I got a phone call from somebody um, because it, I hope you can all relate to this. Um, someone wanted to start an animal health company and was looking for veterinarians and he was working with his neighbor who has a cousin who's married to a guy um, who used to work at MPI and they <laughs> figured, well, he must know veterinarians. And so um, that's how I got connected. And it was actually for a board position but I was considering um, a, a new opportunity, a couple of new opportunities at U of M at the time. And so uh, they ramped it up and, and asked me to come on board uh, as, a, as COO at the time. Um, so we incorporated in May of 2015 um, and I came on board in uh, July of 2015. Um, the real start of Zometica was um, a financial strategy. So, our parent company is in Canada. Um, we 
really wanted to, my co-founder um, and CEO at the time, um, wanted to take a company public on the Canadian stock exchanges um, as an, for access to capital. Um, and he saw animal health as an interesting opportunity because there's not very much diversification in the Canadian markets. It's gas, oil, and mining. And so he took this opportunity to um, start a new sector as a public company. And Canada has this interesting um, opportunity for financing called a capital pool corporation, where essentially a group of investors can pool their money and make a public entity. And that public entity runs like a public entity. It has to file, it has to um, have a board, um, et cetera. But their reason for being is to identify a qualifying transaction within two years. And that qualifying transaction is a company with an actual legitimate business model. Um, and it's basically a, a reverse merger. Um, and then those founders of that um, CPC, then um, that's when they get their return. So it's a really interesting opportunity. It's very interesting for pre-revenue companies because when you take over that company, um, you take over their shareholders and you take over their history on the market. So it automatically gives you up to two years of history and usually you know, a couple hundred um, shareholders. So when you wanna check boxes for going public, it helps you reach a lot of those boxes. And it's also far less expensive than going public in the United States. So you've probably seen other companies do this, particularly biotechs, where they go uh, public on a foreign exchange, either you know in uh, in Germany or in England, and then they eventually potentially cross list the U.S. So that's what we did. So we went public a year after we incorporated on the um, Toronto Stock Exchange Venture Exchange, and then we cross listed in 2017 to the NYSE American. So we're currently listed on the NYSE American. Um, so that was really the strategy that was brought to me, but the business model didn't exist um, as concretely as I thought it really should. Um, we are Zometica Pharmaceuticals, but we've significantly pivoted since then, um, and we're essentially a, a now a diagnostics company. So um, we have uh, formulated um, or, or developed four formulations of drugs for animals, and we're currently looking to um, sell those assets as we focus on diagnostics. Um, and I pivoted us fairly soon because as a veterinarian, um, I felt very comfortable knowing that the pharmaceutical side of things is well covered by the um, Zoetis's, which is Pfizer Animal Health spin out, uh, the Zoetis's and, and uh, Bowringer Ingelheim and Merck, and they've got that part covered. Um, but there were some really interesting diagnostics I had seen in the Ann Arbor area where I thought, now that I would have used in practice. And so we're really a voice of customer led company. I just happened to be the first voice. And instead of focusing on the animals, um, we focused on the veterinarians because veterinarians are the ones who will determine what diagnostic they need. So we need to create a product that essentially um, the, the veterinarians feel they can effectively sell to the owners because we are a cash based business. There's very little. Uh, less than 5% of pets are covered by insurance right now in the US. Um, so I was fortunate enough in all that networking I did, I met um, uh, Kalyan Handik uh, from Handy Lab. And he was uh, at the time the CEO of DeNovo, which turned into Celsi Diagnostics. And so um, he was the first person I reached out to, um, again, for coffee at Sweetwaters and asked if he'd be interesting, uh, interested in out-licensing the veterinary rights for his technology. And so Celsi was the first company that we licensed rights from. Um, and that's what kind of started us down this road of um, really creating a pipeline that through effective partnership, essentially, um, finding the right human diagnostic companies that um, had technology that could uh, benefit veterinary medicine, a cost structure that was pal uh, palatable for veterinary medicine um, and um, ideally was first to um, vet med or alongside human medicine because veterinarians tend to get the technologies that are a couple decades old because they're now on to next generations and so they use um, they get sold into veterinary medicine as a way to um, prolong that that um, life cycle and as a veterinarian, I didn't want to do that. I saw a lot of very cool technology and I thought, well, my patients, I know my clients, they're 
their pets are as equally as I was, I always called myself a pediatrician of furry kid. Um, so uh, that led us to then finding a second company that we licensed uh, technologies from, again, a Southeast Michigan company, it's a spin out from Wayne State um, called Seraph Biosciences. Um, and that was all through networking. So I hired somebody to help me work with Celsi on that contract. And that person had been at the University of Michigan. He was an MIR. And um, he said, hey, I'm doing consulting for this other company. I think you should look at it. Let me, so, uh, let me just inter inter interrupt just for a second and say yeah. you are what I call a super networker. Yes, yes, people. I was. And I, I feel- I think you and Diane ought to write a book about like just how to network your way to success, you know? It's yeah. Like, I, I've actually presented at um, multiple veterinary conferences this concept of networking outside of your um, your circle and how important that is because you know when we started our company um, it you know we were four of us um, I hired Scott Trosen because I needed help with HR um, it's we are really focused on saying we want to be as Michigan based as possible. Um, and bring back to our local community. And um, so it, it, it's, but it's been interesting because we're an animal health company and because we're public, Ann Arbor doesn't know who we are. <laughs> yeah. So well, you're, you should be wearing a t shirt here. For, for, I, you, I know, I should have had my Zomatica swag on. Um, but yeah, we're in South Ann Arbor. I'm, gonna, I'm just looking at the clock and I, need, I want to get back to Elka for a minute because yeah, she didn't yeah. have a chance to be on. So um, if, if you, people have questions for Stephanie, uh, again, Stephanie, you put your, your contact information out there and we're going to have this video uh, up on Monday. So uh, hopefully people could get a chance to, to interact with you and you could get a chance to get better known in Ann Arbor. Uh, you're, you're one of those superstars that around the national, international stage, but not known in Ann Arbor. And that's, uh, that's one of the things we try to do with Leaders Connect is bring folks uh, to the attention of the community. So thank you for, for the bringing what you've done. And it's really been fun to see your, uh, your, your, your path to success. Thank you. And yes, I'll put my contact information up hand there. Out, hand out, uh, hand for, not a hand out, but we'll give a hand <laughs> to Stephanie. We can take those too. <laughs> yeah, hand out too. So and you're on your way to that first billion. We'll be waiting for our call. Uh, okay, thank you, Robert. At Sweetwater, right? <laughs> Yes. Sweetwater is the place. All right. So let me go back. Elka, are you on camera yet? Elka, we can't hear you. So. Yep. I, I, hey, I Elka. <laughs> yeah. Uh, can you see me too? We can see you. You look great. The room <laughs> looks great. Everything's good. So you want to, El Elka, you and I have worked together for, for several years and I'm, I've been, uh, privy and part of, uh, you know, your, your, uh, your process, but can you just talk about what it took from moving your company and turning that around a little bit more? Because I think that's a fascinating story. Yeah. So, you know, as, as so often you, you go into a challenge and you are aware that you are going into a challenge and you, you think to yourself that maybe it takes a year or two to address that challenge and overcome it. So when when Pfizer closed in 2007 and I joined TSRL at that time as Vice President of Business Development, um, the company was founded by Gordon Amidon, a prof professor of the University of uh, Michigan many, many years ago, um, who actually was, was the person who brought me over from Germany to do a, a research study with him when I was a, a graduate student. And um, Gordon had started the company really with a goal to commercialize his own research and his own research only. And um, many, many of his students and postdocs had roles with the company over the years. And during the 90s, when, when pharma was really cooking pretty good, um, they, they had a, a, were focused on drug delivery and formulation um, tablets and, and the whole absorption process of tablets. And they actually had two successful licensing events in the late uh, 90s. They had developed a formulation patent uh, at the University of Michigan and, out and licensed it into TSRL um, that was ultimately acquired by a company uh, called, called back then Falding, uh, which ultimately became Actavis through a series of mergers. 
and the company licensed the patent as a, as a defensive patent for their technology. They didn't want to develop the product, but they wanted to strengthen their IP portfolio and, and use this um, with a controlled release formulation of a um, cardiovascular drug. It was shared IP with the University of Michigan. <clears throat> so the, the beauty was when the license um, was signed, the, the payment started right away. So both TSRL and the University of Michigan actually enjoyed royalty payments for 13 years, which, which I don't know if that happens very frequently in our space. So that certainly helped uh, keeping the company going when, when grant funding fluctuated. And then um, we, uh, I, that was actually during the time when I was there for about four years, we developed, uh, started to develop an, a model to, to model the absorption process and how a tablet dissolves and is absorbed. And, and that um, model was licensed to a guy who came out of aerospace and thought in, in the 90s, oh, pharma is really a great business opportunity and I should somehow get into this. And so he licensed that and, and ultimately turned it into what's called Gastro Plus and is a, is a flagship simulation software um, that, that everybody in the pharmaceutical industry uses. And, and we had, a believe it or not, a never ending license for that software and uh, got 20% of the profits year after year after year. And so that also went on um, for oh, over 15 years. And every time the poor CEO signed this, this check to TSRL, he, he um, got a mild coronary and got angry and angry that he was supposed to make these never ending payments that um, he, he started a pr pretty aggressive campaign to get out of the license. Um, and th they were well capitalized. TSRL was not at the time. This was in 2014. And um, we had also, you know, <laughs> had realized that, that just working with the substrates of science that came from our founder, that was, was not the way we wanted to go forward. And there were some, some real tough negotiation challenges around that. So actually, 13, late 13, 14 was a very, very tough time for us. We were low on grant funding. Um, we had this looming lawsuit on our hands um, over, over the software license. And, and those were pretty stressful times. Um, and then actually also through the Leaders Connect group here through Scott Mertz, I was introduced um, to, um, to a lawyer at Bodman um, and we worked with her um, on the negotiations with, with, the, um, with the simulation plus company. And we had a very bizarre and strange meeting where we, all flew into uh, Chicago and and had to switch airline uh, airline channels and and had a whole day meeting to basically negotiate out of um, that license and walked away with with a, a six million that they bought us out from from that license and actually two two weeks before that we had also gotten notice that we. Um, that a $3 million SBIR grant for, for the one project that we had at the time going. So we, we had a very tough time. We had a very good outcome from that negotiations. We flew back home on a Friday night with 10 million in, in the bank and, and a somewhat optimistic outlook. Um, and um, that was at the time, as, as Rob mentioned, John Hilfinger, who many of you probably also know, was the president of, of TSRL. And, so we got back at midnight and the next morning, John died of a heart attack. And um, it was probably goes down in my life as, as the 24 hours of being the highest and falling the lowest ever. And I also found myself with, with my job and his job and um, quite a few challenges around the board, the family owned board that, you know, kind of perceived that business development is the gloss that goes on science and not somebody that can run a company. So it took me a couple of years to really work with the board, with the founder, bringing new people in many that, that um, I also got connected to through, through networking and the Leaders Connect group. Um, I had a very strong core team, but we were definitely stretched thin. Uh, we were fortunate to bring additional people with really, really deep um, drug development experience onto the team. And um, 
you know, and, and finalize some, some processes and decision-making agreements with the board and the founder in terms of what our flexibility was to um, make decisions for the company and my, my flexibility and my, my role and decision-making authority. It ended up in 2016 that we um, actually parted ways with a very difficult and only collaborator at the time that, that we had in 14. Um, and, and that was part of the challenges of negotiating that, that you know, the board and founder felt like we needed that collaborator, but um, it was a very difficult working relationship and, and there, things happened on that and that, that were probably not um, quite kosher. So in any case, that was sort of a milestone to say, okay, who makes the decisions here? Is this the chairman of the board, which is our founder, or is it, is it the president of the company? So when we hit that milestone, we also had started to see more funding coming in. We reached out to uh, universities worldwide for projects that we were interested in. And uh, so um, working with the University of Washington, the time of Purdue University, um, a small company out of Kentucky. And so funding was starting to come in um, increasingly and we actually en ended up um, in, in the last year being uh, number number seven in, in the state of Michigan with NIH SBIR funding and, and securing somewhere between 12 and 15% of all the funding from the NIH that goes to small businesses. Um, running at about a 2.8 million budget right now. So, you know, as, as success come in, that strengthens, strengthens your position to negotiate. So the next big um, negotiation we en encountered was to say, so if you want us to take these, these technologies forward and, and create value, um, we need to, to change the equity structure in the company. It was exclusively owned by the founder's family. And that took us another two years, believe it or not. Um, and uh, but we at, at the end of 2018, we successfully renegotiated ownership, which is now predominantly owned by management. And that really gave us, close you know, full. <laughs> yeah. And Rob knows because you know he was part of those negotiations. And and really, it was it's sometimes difficult for often difficult for an academic founder to understand the just because you've worked on something and put your heart and soul and sweat into it for so many years, it doesn't mean it has a company value um, that, that you know, guarantees you ownership of that company. And if you wanna see it progress, you, you, know, you just need to take the smaller slice of the pie that hopefully will be growing. So um, it was really only at, at the end of 2018 that we felt like we got full control of the reins and, um, things have been going very well. We're, we're going for a pre ind meeting at the end of July with one of our technologies, a micro needle delivery device for an influenza medication. Um, we have um, three antibacterials that we're working on and evaluating, and uh, another oral antiviral. And, and we're actually with an investigator from Michigan now getting into sepsis and, and COVID. So um, very good. It's been no, a really no, interesting no, ride. Right. I'm just going to. As a narrator here, no host, I'm going to ask people to submit questions uh, at this point. Uh, and if you could just put them on chat and then I'll, if we have time, we'll call on people. But we want to have a chance to wrap up in the next 10 minutes or so and have people uh, questions. But let's ask the panel, first of all, to talk to each other. Kelly, Elka, uh, that must be Stephanie's dog in the background, I imagine. But uh, maybe the three of you could talk to each other. And uh, is that yours, Stephanie? Oh, there it is. All right, the dog. <laughs> is the dog well, the mind, he's too little for a bark like that. Okay, no questions from the dogs. No. Elka, go ahead. Maybe the three of you could talk for a few minutes and then we see if you have any questions coming through. Elka and, and Kelly, reactions to one another? I'll kick it off and, and talk about Elka and uh, Stephanie. How do you work with the Mich Mich tech, tech Transfer? How does that part work for you guys? I will jump in and say I was just sidebar chatting Stephanie, and we're going to connect her to my former colleagues at North Carolina State University, which oh, has the so already fantastic <laughs> College of Veterinary Medicine. Yeah. Um, so you're multitasking on on Zoom. That's 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 very 21st century. <laughs> you're very woke, I guess, as they say. Like passing notes in class. Yeah, okay. 
but work-related notes, importantly. Yes. So yeah, I think, example I of think how that works, Kelly. That's a, that's a good example of how this this Leaders Connect is supposed to work. So, what 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 came to your mind, and what did you do? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, I didn't have any immediate ideas of um, technologies that we have at the University of Michigan, but you know, we've heard a little bit about the rivalries today. And you know, it was hard to go work here because I'm a Spartan. But the great thing about university tech transfer is really we don't compete with each other. It's very collaborative. And the more that um, we can help connect, um, you know, each other with the right companies and the right potential licensees, it, it benefits everyone. So my idea for Stephanie was, well, tell me more about the kind of, you know, diagnostic assays you guys are <laughs> moving forward. What would you be interested in? And um, so I'm going to connect her to my colleagues at NC State, which do a lot of work in, in, in biomarkers through their College of Veterinary Medicine. Um, and um, I haven't personally worked with um, TSRL on any of our, our deals, but I know that, um, you know, there there's been, been a lot through our office and there's a, a you know, a few um, currently underway. So I'd be happy to hear Elka's, um, you know, comments about how that's working. Yeah, so I, I think, you know, that it's been actually really fantastic working with your group. And, and I think it, it kicked it significantly up a notch since your arrival. Um, we've obviously always had um, interactions with the tech transfer group at Michigan. And, and I, you know, I can speak for my founder, and I don't know how much it's true for, for others. Um, there seemed to have been in the past always a little bit of a reluctant reluctance to work with the tech transfer groups and the perception that they didn't necessarily value the invention as much as the inventor valued them and, and wanted predominantly uh, funding to get patents paid. And uh, my experience has been entirely different, both on the business formation side and on the licensing side. I think um, we've, we've had really good relationships and conversations. And, and in particular, you know, in, in the last couple of years, Kelly, I mean, I, I just uh, got an option for a joint IP that we have on an antiviral um, therapeutic for DNA virus infections and um, interacted on a number of other occasions. And, and as I said, have, have a potential new collaboration with an investigator that, that um, works in sepsis and, and, and COVID space. So it, it's been great. And I think, you know, the, um, I just even though you, you had the, some of the um, pace challenges at the beginning, looking at it from the outside, I think it, it really expedited quite a bit since your arrival. I also want to applaud the, uh, the female leadership theme here. Uh, we, we're in a very unique s situation in the state. Uh, Brittany, are you out there, Brittany Aftaller? I just saw a note from her. Brit I'm here. Yeah, Brittany, you want to comment on uh, all the the female leadership uh, that, that you and uh, what you see with that in, in your role too? Maybe you could also talk. I want Brittany. You, I got a couple things to ask you also about the fund that you sit on at the uh, you're on the board of. So, um, I, I'm not sure exactly what to to say um, other than you know there there are certainly instances where my my colleagues, um, Alka and Stephanie and Kelly and Anne DeSanti were, were in spaces, we often are the only women, but um, I think it's interesting, this group, it's, it's, it's notable because um, there are more women. And I think, you know, it's, it's a step, but we're, I don't think that this should uh, mask the fact that out beyond here, it, it still is very male dominated. And so, um, you know, the more diversity we can get into these spaces, especially in the life sciences, um, I think the stronger the field can be. So, so I, you know, I, I applaud that this is an all woman panel, but I don't want to lure anyone into the expectation that it's like this everywhere because it's, it's, it's got, still got a long way to go. And with that, I might ask uh, Kelly or Elka or Stephanie to comment on that too. Yeah, I, I completely agree. Um, being that we are a public company, most of my interactions and communications from an investor standpoint are with Wall Street. Um, so I am very frequently the only woman in the room um, and have experienced probably more um, challenges on that regard than I've ever had in my career before um, because it's not, it's not a local environment that I'm talking to. Um, 
and also our sector, our customers, veterinarians um, are significantly more female than male. Um, I think, I'm gonna guess maybe 60 to 70% of most practicing veterinarians are, are women. Um, and so animal health companies, particularly the, the public ones, which most of the large ones are, um, their, their executive leadership and their boards aren't necessarily representative of the customers. And so um, it is a frustration and it's something, at least in my sector, um, that they're actively trying to, uh, to work towards. And how about a minority participation how big a, a challenge is that to to uh, to find minority uh, people to, to hire uh, I don't know how, how that's going in the state I'll just speak to mine real quick but it's a challenge in our industry significant issue um, that we've been working towards in veterinary medicine for years but it, it's um, it's a very Caucasian profession for sure okay yeah, yeah I mean I, I would second that I, I it, it's a challenge to find qualified candidates with the level of diversity that we would like to hire. Um, we, we hired last year Marquisia Pierce, who, who many of you also know, and um, she is a, she is a, a PhD MBA, PhD from Vanderbilt, and has been with us for, for about a year now and, and is a super talented African-American woman, and we're very excited to have her on board. And I, so, think she, I think she's on board right now. Marquisia, are you there? Yes, I am. Oh, you want to say hi and uh, introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. Um, <laughs> we don't see you, Marquisha. Is your camera on? No, my uh, broadband is a little bit low. This okay. Morning. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's it's been a pleasure to listen to um, the the panel today, um, and just kind of getting getting representation in the uh, space. You know, one thing at a time, or you know, inch by inch, uh, is is a is a challenge, but I'm, I'm really, really encouraged by seeing the women here and um, understanding their story and getting to getting some intention behind bringing more diverse people into their level of influences and their their spheres. Um, so I'm, I'm encouraged by that. Okay, great. Well, it's uh, any any other comments from the audience? Uh, any other uh, chats? Um, certainly, lots of exciting things going on. Uh, can you give us, uh, Elka, I know you've been working in infectious diseases for a long time and, and particularly in viruses. Uh, what, what is your, uh, what's happening now in, in, in the research area? There's hundreds of companies, I guess, working on vaccines. What, what do you see going on? Yeah, so I can honestly say I've, in, in my entire career, I've never seen anything like this right from the beginning, that level of mobilization and collaboration um, in, in for any therapy or anything. So I'm quite encouraged. I think there are about 140 therapeutics, vaccines and, and um, therapeutics in development right now. Um, there's there's massive collaboration around understanding the virus and, and um, leveraging similarities between other viruses. For example, I've recently read an article that the, the polio vaccine um, uh, could potentially be, has enough similarity between the viruses that it, it could help out and, and give us a little bit more immunity until we actually have a firm vaccine for the coronavirus. Um, there, there's still a ways to go because, I mean, it, things take time and we don't understand. It's my dog again, I apologize. <laughs> um, you know, exactly how, how immunity will uh, stay after vaccination, but I'm pretty encouraged that we will have some solutions by the fall that will certainly soften the blow and then sometime maybe by ne middle of next year really a vaccine that's available for, for, for other population. I'm, I'm sure Kelly you have a perspective on that too. Yeah, I do. And I actually also wanted to address the, the earlier question too about, um, you know, participation of women and minorities both in our, in our, um, in our fields. So this has long been a, a passion project of mine. And um, one of the first things we've been doing, I see, you know, I see one of our lanes for this is making sure that the, the folks that we're working with at the university, um, that we're doing as much outreach as we can, because I, I have this sense that people come into contact with tech transfer and patenting through networks. And so if um, you're a woman, if you're an underrepresented minority, you might not have mentors and sponsors who are looking at your work and saying, that's really good. 
you should call the tech transfer office and see about getting a patent because they may not have that experience or you just may not have great mentors and sponsors because of network effects. So thinking, you know, understanding the, the extent of that. So we've been, um, we've started tracking gender data on the inventors that are, um, that we're currently working with, wanting to make sure that that's tracking with um, the ratio of uh, women faculty and grad students that we have at the university. And our next step that we're now um, starting to engage with some data scientists around is also understanding minority status of um, the innovators that we're working with to make sure that, you know, it is representing the the diversity that we actually have on campus in our, our research enterprise. The second piece, and it was alluded to, um, you know, when we're talking to um, investors, it's a very male um, dominated, dominated world. Um, so there's, you know, there's a lot of things that can be done there. I happen to think that, you know, encouraging more women to become angel investors is a great area to bring more women into this space. I think there's a lot of untapped potential there that would be um, great for our economy and would unlock this additional, um, you know, avenue of alternative investment for women. And again, it's network effects. If you're not part of an, a network, you're not being introduced to this. So I think being being mindful of this and, and thinking of ways that, that we can ensure we have diverse representation on things like our awards. Um, we've had a, a Distinguished University Innovator Award at the University of Michigan for 14 years. Um, we, our first um, woman was um, selected just two years ago. And, and that's, that's ridiculous. And it, part of it becomes from who's on the award committee. Are we reaching out and saying, you're great. You would be great for this. You should apply. Um, and it's, it's really simple things like that, that can, that can start to make a difference. And I just, you know, if you think about um, a belief in the importance of innovation for things like um, attacking COVID or, or for really any of our societal problems, you need a diversity of thinkers around the room and, and not just a certain group of people um, driving that agenda. So um, that's what I wanted to say about that. Uh, Rob, this is Britt and, and Kelly, I wanna just piggyback on that a little bit. And I know Rob, you wanted to talk a little bit about the Michigan Strategic Fund. Um, the one caveat I would add is that the responsibility for bringing in more women and people of color into this field, into all fields and um, creating pathways for them, particularly when it comes to financing is imperative, that's on all of us. So I see Phil Santer on, you know, the daily job he does at Yenever Spark and Michael Cole. And I mean, I know this is important to all of you because we've talked about it, but it is, it's all of our responsibilities. And so when you're sitting at the Michigan Strategic Fund and you're seeing the very top of the funnel, all the activities that are going on um, to get to that point, I will tell you, we are still not seeing enough women and people of color getting those kinds of programming and getting the help that they need. So it's, it's, it's imperative that we all pull our weight in that respect. So that's the only thing I would add. Okay, I'm, I'm going to give everybody uh, on the panel a chance to just uh, last, last words of encouragement or uh, actions. Uh, what, what can people do? Uh, we've had a very lively discussion. I really appreciate it. And we've had a very lively participation from the audience, which is, uh, Roger points out, 50% female today. So that's, that's exciting. And um, Stephanie, Kelly, Elka, last, last words as we wrap up. Um, I would just say, just be kind to yourself and be kind to your people if you're in a leadership position. Um, I think unlike any other time I've ever um, been involved in as a professional, um, everyone on our teams is dealing with something big right now because there's just so much going on. So just be empathetic and be kind and um, that starts with being kind with yourself. So. I love that. It's great. Thank you. Yeah, Stephanie, I, I think that's that's great. And, you know, if if there's a silver lining of this, it's humanized us all. This is probably the first um, conference or webinar I've done where I haven't had one of my kids wander into the field and ask for a snack or lunch or something. So, you know, everybody's dealing with something, but, in, you know, and 
juggling childcare and homeschooling and, you know, senior care and everything else on, on top of work as our tradition, you know, the infrastructure we relied on for those things has, has gone away, um, you know, and, and people are dealing with the emotional stress of the pandemic, the financial fallout. And now, you know, with the um, Black Lives Matter movement moving to the forefront, we're realizing people, many people on our team are dealing with a level of pain that had largely gone unrecognized. So I, I think Stephanie's absolutely right. Um, more kindness, thought, empathy, and learning. Yeah, I, I would piggyback on that as well. As, as I, I've, in recent years, the years had gotten increasingly discouraged that we were moving as a country in the wrong direction and the way we're treating each other and the way we're treating women and minorities. And I think in a way, the as painful as the events of the last few month war between the virus and the Black Lives Matters movement, it, it galvanized us. And I think, you know, we see much more support across uh, different groups and, and on a personal level and everybody just kind of slows down slightly and revs down the intensity and really tries to take care of the people around them. Thank you very much. I think this emphasizes that, you know, we have a choice point here, we're at 2020, we're going to be either looking back on it as, a, as an awful year and one that we want to forget, or we might be looking at the opportunity for 2020 when things started to turn around and that we really had kindness, we had uh, leadership from minorities, that we had women uh, emerging as, as the spokespersons for what, what need to be happening and maybe electing a, a, a minority uh, woman vice president would, would be really nice. Uh, we'll see what happens with that, but uh, it could be a, a turning point that that's good. Remember the, uh, the, the uh, 1919 virus uh, led to the roaring 20s. So who knows, you know, we may have the roaring 20s again. That'd be nice. I'd like to be part of that. <laughs> All right, everybody signing off. We'll hopefully be back in the next couple of weeks. And uh, I'd like to hear any suggestions people have for panels. Uh, we've been doing this now for about 10 weeks, but great panel today. Thank you, Stephanie. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you, Elka. Elka, for putting this together. You've been working on this for several months, and we <laughs> applaud you for doing that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elka. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rob, for moderating and for uh, all your advice through this time. Okay, we'll, we'll have this out on a, on a uh, feed. If, if all of you could send me any of your ideas, uh, the speakers, I'll, I'll post those on Monday with Dr. Rob Collins. So thank you very much. Thank all you. Right. Great. Bye-bye. Well. Be well and enjoy the day.